Well, welcome to Cyprus, the birthplace of Aphrodite. I mean, and just for that would be a good reason to visit Cyprus. Um, this is the photo from yesterday. I would like to thank all the patients, especially who made it to be with us. And the aims of this presentation is to explain who we are, what we do in Cyprus, and how we engaged into the international uh, effort to, to uh, treat or cure Alport. Uh, how focal and segmental sclerosis led our research journey to Alport, how collagen-4 nephropathy behaves as a multifactorial malady, the high burden of autosomal dominant Alport syndrome and TBMN in Cyprus may be higher compared to other countries. I'm not sure about that. Maybe you are more sensitive about it. Of course, genetic modifiers, you know how, how passionate I am about finding genetic modifiers, not very successfully. How the unfolded protein response is a, was a new concept in Allport that guided us to the next step. Uh, how the first Noggin mouse model for Allport syndrome uh, was created in my lab and how repurposing of chaberons in a preclinical trial for Allport is giving some more hope. This is Arthur Cesar Alport, who we honor by naming the disease Alport syndrome. Somebody had decided years after uh, to, to name the disease after his name, but they did. Um, and I, I showed yesterday this, uh, this uh, slide as well to introduce to the unconverted, to people who are new in the field, how confusing it can be to the non-expert to have two diseases or the same disease, the same clinical phenotype with an autosomal recessive or autosomal dominant or X-linked inheritance. We can only easily, I think, understand X-linked disorder. We can probably easily understand autosomal recessive. What we find difficult in understanding is how the carriers, as we used to, as we used to call the heterozygotes, who only have one copy of the gene, are not absolutely healthy. They are not. In many, many other recessive disorders that we also have in, uh, in, 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 in nephrology, many recessive disorders, the, the carriers, those who have one copy of the defective gene, are absolutely healthy. There may be some exceptions as well. But this is a, an exemplar case where the heterozygotes start with hematuria and they have a, a high risk to develop something worse than that. Not all of them, but many. So the two heterozygous people at the top, the parents of an affected child with autosomal recessive, typical, classic, severe Alford, well, those parents, I repeat, are not absolutely healthy. Now, until about 2000, I knew very little about fifth basement membrane, fifth basement membrane nephropathy. I used to hear about it when I was going to the nephrology conferences in Greece mostly, but I didn't know much about it. I only understood there was something wrong with the collagen. Um, so at the time, I was still very busy with polycystic kidney disease. You may not know it, but when the PKD2 gene was cloned, the polycystic kidney disease type 2 gene was cloned, uh, there were three families described. The first three families where a, a mutation was found in the PKD2 gene um, on, on chromosome, uh, four. chromosome 4. Well, two of those three families were our families that we followed in Cyprus with Dr. Pierre Ries. So I was very busy with polycystic kidney disease. And then uh, we, we ran into something that was focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, and we started reading the literature. You can see some names there, not all of them, but these are papers we, we came to, to, to read and understand what was going on. And I will explain in more detail. So um, in all of this older literature, there were a few, very few sporadic papers associating heterozygous situations, hematuria, familiar hematuria, with thin basement membrane nephropathy, and sometimes, sometimes, a case of severe disease. But there was none to really associate so intimately 
that heterozygous for a collagen four mutation could have focal and segmental glomerulosclerosis. Um, so in early 2000s, um, a, a nephrologist in, 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 in a nephrologist who was doing his residency in Athens came to my lab to spend his six month fellowship. He wanted to do some, something in the lab, Dr. Lucas Damiano. So we, we had collected already many families with foreground segmental glomerulosclerosis, and we started looking for mutations. We could find nothing. Uh, we even got a grant. We even got a grant to, to they were funded to study families with fo segregating focal and segmental glomerulosclerosis. There's no, there was no word about thin bed membrane nephropathy or hematuria. It was FSGS. So after Lugas left, Constantinos Voskaridis uh, came uh, to my lab and he couldn't find anything either. And then he, he said, listen, I'm tired with this story. But in any case, uh, I, I noticed that in, these patients also have familiar hematuria, whatever that means. And familiar hematuria, when I searched it up, something like collagens come up. Okay, collagens. I, was, I, I thought I had gotten away from collagens uh, that I worked during my PhD thesis, and now I came against collagens again. And to cut the long story short, these were the two big publications with 10 families from Cyprus with more than 80 patients, all of them diagnosed with focal segmental glomerulosclerosis based on biopsy results. And we found the first heterozygous mutations in the collagen type four. And even in the title, it was actually the, the suggestion of the editor that we use the, the term um, dual diagnosis, dual diagnosis of focal segmental glomerulosclerosis and thin basement membrane nephropathy. And, and that's how it all started. As I said yesterday, this is one of the many, many very large pedigrees we have in Cyprus. You notice on the right, uh, a kaplan mayer analysis, which shows that by the, age of, by the age of 70 or 75 years, in our population, out of 250 patients or so, all of them heterozygous, we, we proved that. Up to 30% reached end-stage kidney disease, up to 30%. I know we've discussed this many times with Dan as well and many others. We may be biased, but what I what I assume, what I presume, what I hypothesize is that even if it's not 30 percent, but it's 25, it's 20, it's still very high. Even 15, whatever, it's still very high because if one in 100 is a heterozygous, as very nicely was shown by a group led by Judy Savage, it's still a very high percentage in the general population. This was a table showing that it was those 10 tables, the 10 families where the primary diagnosis given to us by the doctors was FSGS. Um, yeah. And then when we published this paper in the JSN, in the same issue, there was this editorial commentary by Karsten. I mean, Karsten. I remember when I was reading through to understand what was going on, I even wrote to Karsten and ask him to send me uh, preprints of his papers to understand collagen ne for nephropathy and thin basement membrane nephropathy. So in this one, one of the many large families, uh, we see everything. We see patients with only isolated microscopic hematuria nearly for life, plus a little bit of proteinuria. Uh, we have five patients in the third and fourth generation who reached end stage renal disease. Uh, we even have one patient uh, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, generation three, four, who was a phenocovy. He had kidney disease without the mutation in the family. And he, we even have one who was asymptomatic. He had a mutation and he was asymptomatic at advanced age. And then we had also two twins who had identical mutation and, and clinical phenotype. So many interesting things. And then a very recent finding, very recent finding that Christiana is going to talk about maybe later today or tomorrow in her poster is, the, is four families with the same founder mutation and different founder mutation. And in the big family, you see two affected people. One is homozygous with typical alport, end stage at 58. 
The other one is heterozygous. The one on the right is heterozygous, end stage at, uh, at, at uh, uh, 50, for, uh, 46 and 58. So 46, the, the homozygous, 58, the heterozygous. So another case where TBMN doesn't behave the same for everybody. Now, studying Cyprus for so many years, we have put together what I call the nephrogenetic map of founder mutations in Cyprus. This is only for founder mutations. Every spot is a village where we found families, maybe more than one, with heterozygous mutations in collagen 4A3 or collagen 4A4. What's impressive is that the blue dots are all villages in the Mesauria, as we call it. Um, and all of them have this one very strong founder mutation with more than 22 families and more than 200 patients having this one identical mutation. And you know what? Even though they have this identical mutation, they don't all have the same exact clinical course. It varies a lot from microscopic hematuria to added proteinuria, FSGS, chronic kidney disease, and even end-stage kidney disease, about 20% of those patients. And then we came across this question. Why do we have this great, great, great phenotypic heterogeneity? Is it because of co-inherited genetic modifiers? Is it because of environmental factors, epigenetics, a combination of the above? And to cut the long story short, no need to go into more detail. This is something we all published together, the members of the organizing committee, where we put together all the known published potential likely genetic modifiers. In fact, one of them, the one at the top, is this one variant in the Padocin gene, the R229Q, which was published by four or five different groups, suggesting that it is a genetic modifier predisposing TBMN people to a more severe outcome. And then several others as well. So in my view, the full spectrum of the phenotype of heterozygous people behaves as a multifactorial condition implicating primary genes, the collagens, so modifier genes, and environmental factors. So every patient can be placed anywhere on this spectrum. People are born with microscopic hematuria. They stay for life with it or a little bit of proteinuria, but some of them progress to focal segmental glomerulosclerosis and end-stage kidney disease. Now, these are accumulated data for autosomal dominal alpha syndrome or thin basement membrane nephropathy, heterozygous patients. So far, we have found more than uh, nearly 50 families with a mutation in the col 4 a 3 another 38 families with a mutation in the col 4 a 4 and altogether nearly uh, 500 patients. Now, these are 500 patients that we have tested molecularly. We had DNA. You can assume or hypothesize that the real number may be double, because in many families, we didn't manage to, to collect samples from every one of the people at risk, okay? And of course, there may be still many, many more who remain undiagnosed for various reasons. In families where perhaps there is no adverse outcome, they may not come to our attention yet. Uh, so in 22 families who have this founder mutation, the glycine 1334 deglutamate uh, with, with 200 patients or so, and a couple of other founder mutations. Now, this is an accumulated genetic map for the typical X-linked or autosomal recessive families. And as you can appreciate, the number of families and the number of patients is much, much smaller, much smaller. It's altogether, we have about 15 families that we identify the mutation in the X link called 4A5 or recessive. In fact, recessive, I think it, it may be three or four altogether. And then the same thing for Greece. We've been a referral center until recently, and we still are to some extent, from the four other clinics, they refer patients to us. And altogether we have tested so far nearly 40 
families from all over Greece who were referred to us because of uh, uh, X-linked or autosomal recessive OPU syndrome. In fact, the overwhelming majority of them was X-linked OPU syndrome. And then there was this question that was again in the literature, people with, with, with heterozygous mutations who present also with cysts, the cystic phenotype. Uh, in our publication in 2009, we had, this is the one in, in nephrology dialysis transplantation, we had 11 uh, families. In four of those families, there was cystic phenotype, but we could not find something in the PKD genes. In fact, we, we didn't even look at it. We didn't think it was real polycystic kidney disease. Subsequently, there were a couple of more uh, publications from Spain and from the United States asking the same question. Do these people have mutations in cystic genes, PKD1, PKD2, or the others? And they couldn't really find something convincing. Our finding, very, very recent convincing, uh, I'm sorry, very, very recent finding, uh, we, uh, we are still working on it, was a patient who had this one mutation, which is a frame sheet mutation in blue in the cold 4 a 3 gene. And because his doctor was very insistent, my patient has polycystic kidney disease. He may have also autosomal dominant upper syndrome, but what I see is polycystic kidney disease. So he referred it to us, we did testing and we found a mutation, a pathogenic variant in the AARG8 gene, which causes polycystic liver disease with or without uh, kidney cysts. We are working on it. Now, uh, the other thing is that many, many families, do we find mutations in, in every one of them? No, Jody, no. Uh, I know we've discussed this sometimes with some of you, and Judy actually was asking me specifically at one time recently, well, we have uh, 80, 60, 67 families and sporadic and, and 25 sporadic patients that all of these people, Irini, Dionysius, Apostolos, uh, Grigoris are working on it. And, and we couldn't find anything in the usual suspects. Then we did whole exome sequencing, and we are in the process of making sense out of it because we, we don't know what to make of it. I'm just showing you one example, one example I'm showing where we found variants, many, many variants, more than 500 variants in more than 400 genes. Most of them are recessive genes. Most of them are recessive genes. And let me, let me repeat if I didn't say it already, that in most of these families, we had more than two affected people. It was not just one sporadic. Okay, in, 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 40, in 60 of them, in 67 of those families, we had information about two or three affected people. So all of these variants that we found here, this is an example, is genes which are recessive, and we do not find two variants in the same gene by allelic to justify autosomal recessive inheritance or they are genes that I hear about them for the first time. And I don't know what next to say to it. So it's an open question. I know other people also have similar experience. I don't know to what extent, but this is a question. Maybe we, we should do more deep intronic sequencing. Maybe we should do genomic sequencing. I am not sure. Every, every, every scenario is still open. And then, let us, let us move to mice, Jeff and Oliver. This is from the meeting in Gettingen, Jeff. So in 2013, it was, uh, 14 it was, we showed for the first time this new well-known phenomenon that we call unfolded protein response. We showed for the first time in humans, in human biopsies, as well as in cell culture experiments and in a mouse model we created that this, uh, this that, that Alport creates the, unfold, the unfolded protein response, which means that this cascade of events in an effort to correct the, the not correctly folded primary molecules 
you have this response. You have chaperones going up and down, up, preferably, and ER stress. We didn't show ER stress specifically, but we showed activation of the unfolded protein response. So we took this as, an, as a trigger to think, okay, if there is overexpression, overactivation of the unfolded protein response, could we probably assist with synthetic external chaperones? So we created this mouse model of Opus syndrome. It's a Noggin mouse model. It was the first at the time, the first Noggin mouse model, where we introduced the founder mutation we found in Cypriot patients. Okay, so it's position 1334, but on the mouse homologue, it's 1332. So we introduced this mutation and we generated heterozygous and homozygous mice. We also generated mice that we crossed with the knockout model that Oliver sent us a few mice, so that we generated mice which have one allele missing entirely and the other one has a mutation. And we showed uh, what we think is, and the reviewers agreed, uh, typical severe Alpo syndrome. Danica, the pathologist, agrees with that. I say this because sometimes some of the reviewers question it. And as you can appreciate, they also have, in addition to the biochemistry and the histology, they also have reduced lifespan. Okay, you can see the, the survival analysis at the down left. So we, we use this mouse model without going into any, into any great detail. We gave them 4PBA. 4PBA is a small molecule synthetic chaperone, which is approved by the FDA in other diseases. So it's repurposing, okay? It's typical repurposing. And you can appreciate the improvement of the clinical picture going from the left, where the, the mice up, the, the electron microscopy up, up uh, to the right, where electron microscopy shows a typical outward pathognomonic thinning, thickening, lamellation, whatever, of the basement membrane. In the case they are treated with PBS, serum. In the middle, it's Tutka, which doesn't do anything. It's another chaperon, synthetic chaperon. And on the left, you can see that 4PBA chaperon in reality converts a typical severe ultra phenotype to something more of a thin basement membrane nephropathy. And you have data which support also uh, the biochemistry. Uh, uh, Christophoros or Pavlos, one of my people, will give you more details on this uh, in, in their posters. So um, it seems to be a good approach if we can verify it further. Now, I would like to end this presentation by saying that there was one, what, this recent publication in the, in the JCI where the group of Tobias and Huber, uh, Tobias Huber, and, and uh, Grahamer, if I say it correctly, they published this paper where they say that in humans and in a mouse model, they generated a thin basement membrane nephropathy picture can be generated from mutations in the prolyl 3 hydroxylase 2. I remind you, basic biochemistry, that prolyl 3 hydroxylase 2 is an enzyme which adds uh, hydroxyl groups on the three position of prolines in the collagen domain. We know that proline is, uh, is the second most frequent amino acid in the collagens after glycine. And some of these, not, ma not, not, not many, very few prolines in specific positions, they are hydroxylated on the third position, not on the fourth. And there's a specific enzyme for this because it's an important post-translational event, very important uh, post-translational event. And when this enzyme was mutated, it generated, in addition to some hearing problems, a thin basement membrane nephropathy picture. I, I was asked to publish a commentary on this paper in, in, the, kidney, in, the, in, the, in the Kidney International, actually. Uh, the, the, the commentary, not in the JCI. And when I read the paper carefully, I thought, and I suggested actually in my commentary, that this 
picture they described, the authors, was also qualified for Opfort, not only thin basement membrane nephropathy, but that was my opinion. You can read it. So it may be that the Opfort phenotype is generated by another different, totally different gene. It's a much, much rarer situation, of course. So in conclusion, we know a lot about Opfort and related collagen for nephropathies in Cyprus. And not only, of course. Um, we apply a good genetics approach for disease diagnosis, verification, and patient identification. And it's one of the, it's one of the achievements uh, over the past 10 years that through better technologies and next generation sequencing, we've been able quickly and more efficiently identify mutations in these patients. But we also identify many VUS, variants of uncertain significance, and we don't know what to make with them. That's why we need better tools and new tools to evaluate their pathogenicity. And we're working on that. Uh, some of you visited yesterday the zebrafish facility we are preparing, where we try to introduce some mutations in, or variants rather, into zebra to see whether they generate a phenotype. Uh, we need to apply a more aggressive approach in upgrading our output patient registry I'm talking about Cyprus, but maybe other countries as well, uh, and study more diligently the disease natural course. We need the, the, the contribution, we need the assistance of clinical nephrologists to, to take a closer look to all of our patients and do a more careful work on the natural course of the disease. We need more, more clinicians to engage in this effort. We need more patients to engage in this effort. And we are still in search for sound answers in the following two questions. Why some heterozygous patients, but not others, progress to severe kidney function decline, something that every one of us is bothered with, especially the clinicians who have to make decisions. And how is the worst pathology developed? I mean, what is it? What is the molecular and cellular mechanism which leads to FSGS, proteinuria, and the worst outcome in, in these patients, especially when they have the same exact mutation? And let me end this by saying that we are really very proud to be part of this Alpert Alliance. Um, it means a lot to my group in Cyprus in a somewhat remote place geographically, but with, with a very vivid uh, team and projects uh, handling and tangling uh, all post syndrome and related nephrobots. So thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, also our sponsors, our funding agencies, the European Commission, the Cyprus Research Promotion Foundation, and, and all of those who have uh, engaged themselves so closely, the, the clinicians, of course, the patients uh, who believed in us and shared with us all of this uh, information.